Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we are talking about Dune, part one, the 2021 film directed by Denis Villeneuve, screenplay by John Spates, Denis Villeneuve, and Eric Roth, based on the novel Dune, written by Frank Herbert. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Arand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayeros. Hi. So before we dive into Dune, as a quick announcement, we're going to start doing video podcasts on the Beyond the Screenplay YouTube channel. And we've always had versions of the podcast on the channel, but now you can see our faces. So you can see all of us smiling at you and waving. If Sorry. You were, if, <laughs> except for Brian. Uh, <laughs> so all of that is on the YouTube channel. So head over to the Beyond the Screenplay YouTube channel and subscribe if you want to watch the video versions of these podcasts. Uh, and a question for our Spotify listeners and people on watching, uh, people watching on YouTube is now that Dune is out, what are your top three favorite Denis Villeneuve movies? Ooh, that's a hard one now. Right? That's now really you, hard. Now we have to like make some choices. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's dive in to Dune. So I'm really excited to finally talk to you guys about this because <laughs> I was lucky enough to... Uh, be invited to maybe the first industry screening of Dune uh, a month ago, like literally four weeks or, ago or so. And I swore that I wasn't going to like say anything or even like look at you guys in the eyes, basically, like when like <laughs> Dune came up because I didn't want to influence anything. So it's been stressful. You did a really good job. Yeah. I didn't you. pick up anything from you. Excellent. I'm, I'm neither seen nor heard. Um <laughs> But yeah, so I, I got to go to the screening and it was on the Warner Brothers lot in their big screening um, theater with Dolby Atmos. And it was just like, it was a whole experience. It was mm. like so immersive. And Trish and Alex, you guys have talked about the Sundance effect a little mm -hmm. bit where like mm. sometimes if you see a movie in a special setting, that like specialness, like like little fairy dust, like <laughs> goes over the whole experience. It makes it extra magical. Um and so it was definitely that. Like I walked out of that first screening of Dune being like, I've I have not been so immersed in a movie in so, so long mm -hmm. and have just been taken on this crazy journey, half of a journey. Uh <laughs> and it was like, yeah, it was incredible. I was really, really excited about it. Watching it again yesterday, still really great. I some of the like fairy dust has worn off, and now there are things that I'm uh interested to to talk about and kind of constructively critique with you guys um but overall i thought it was a truly incredible like film experience um so i want to hear from you guys about your experiences and your first reactions uh to do some like contrasting we'll we'll start with alex and then we'll go to trisha so alex how did you see the movie <laughs> ends of the theater experience spectrum <laughs> yes. lack thereof uh so i went and saw it as soon as i could which is 6 p.m on thursday like the first preview screening and i saw it at the biggest imax screen available to me and i your description sounds about right michael for my first experience it was a magical fairy dust laden <laughs> experience and i think part of it was that opening night energy you know yeah. you had kind of maybe an, mm. an excited industry crowd in that theater who was just rooting for the movie and I feel like the theater I was in, it was a packed full, you know, it's one of the grand, they call it the grand theaters, the grand IMAX theaters, the full like square, the science center style where you get vertigo wow. walking in. Uh, <laughs> and you have a packed theater of people excited to see this movie in that theater. And then the sound, the music, <laughs> the mm. visuals, you know, a, yeah. about a, it feels like a lot of this movie is in the full frame IMAX, especially in the latter half. Um, mm -hmm. Like everything with him and his mom, like in the desert on is it just most of it felt like it was in the full IMAX format. Uh, so it was just completely immersive visually and sonically. And I, I, I felt like I was getting like a sound bath in that theater. Like my <laughs> whole body was like, like feeling the movie physically in a, in like a good way, in a way that wasn't distorting the sound or the speakers weren't unable to handle it it was just exactly right to just my entire being was in this movie and i hadn't felt that way honestly since, since i was a kid i think like it, wow. it it brought me back to those early like star wars style 
movie experiences where I'm just like, I am transported. I'm in this and I just love the vibrations I'm getting from this film. And I just want to <laughs> live here. Uh, and I also saw it a second time, just, you know, much shorter time period, but I just saw it again today, right, right before this podcast. And it was interesting because it was a different crowd. It was a midday showing. It was a noon showing. Mm -hmm. I still saw it in IMAX. because I was like, I just wanted the IMAX experience <laughs> one more time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, I hadn't had a couple drinks with dinner beforehand. And, and I, you know, I've already seen the movie once. And it was interesting to, to see how yeah, the fairy dust was lifted. Mm -hmm. But man, I still absolutely love the experience. I just think it's such a such a feat, this movie. I just can't believe he pulled it off uh, how he did. So, uh, so much to talk about. But I, I definitely, it was probably my favorite movie theater experience in like adult memory, uh, wow. so, which wow. is saying something. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really incredible. I yeah, I should mention that I was at that industry screening because uh, I was there with my friend Michael Coleman, who I've mentioned on the podcast before, who has a video series website called Soundworks Collection, where he interviews uh, the sound designers and sound mixers working in the industry and sometimes the director. So the night after we saw it, we got to interview Denny Villeneuve and his sound team and listen to a roundtable. It was so, so cool to like, as you're saying, sound is such a huge part of this movie and the experience. And so listening to them talk about it was amazing. Uh, the, all of that content should be out by the time this episode releases. Mm. So check the show nice. notes uh, and definitely check out these these conversations because it's so, so interesting. Um, but yes, okay. So Alex, big screen, big sound, super immersive. Trisha, hit me. Yeah, so <laughs> due to circumstances completely beyond my control and just like sort of a perfect storm of inaccessibility for mostly scheduling reasons and like just sort of other things happening in my life, I was not able to go and see this in the movie theater at all. But I, I figured it's probably good for somebody to bring the HBO Max experience to the table. So I'm here to talk to you about that. I watched this in my took house. took one for the team. I yeah. really did. <laughs> <laughs> I watched this in my own living room on my own fine television <laughs> with my adequate speakers. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I had a couple of friends with me, which was great. Um, I talked in, I think it was a Quiet Place part two podcast about how people watching things at home has sort of like eroded your decorum about like movie theaters where when you're at home and you can pause the movie and you can mm -hmm. like kind of chat to whoever you're sitting with. And um, so that was also happening. Like my two mm -hmm. friends were um, kind of chatting a little bit with me while we were watching it, which is super different where like in real time, you're kind of unpacking it. And I should say that both of those people are like also um, movie people and like kind of analytical brained movie brained people. They're certainly not average moviegoers. They have a lot of, um, they have a lot of cinematic sort of prowess and, and knowledge uh, that they were bringing to the table. And so it was like, I could not imagine a more different experience. And I will say that within like two frames of the movie starting, all three of us were like, we have done this wrong. <laughs> um, this is not we we are doing a very bad job of this movie right now um <clears throat> and keep in mind as someone who listeners will know but like and you guys know i'm hyper tuned to story and character things and i am not hyper tuned to visual things or sound things as much or like sort of you know technical technique um but even within, yeah, just a couple of frames of this movie, we were all just like, no, oh, no. <laughs> um, which is not to say that we had a bad experience. We did. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun and we had a, a really good experience overall. You know, uh, I think it was like 20, 30 minutes into it. I was like, do we need popcorn? And they, we need so much popcorn. Yeah, and so like, all we the just, popcorn. We just paused the movie and we just made like huge bowl of popcorn and all like we're leaning forward like just eating it out off the coffee table and you know trying to get closer to the screen <laughs> <laughs> and closer i thought you were gonna say you went to a movie theater got popcorn <laughs> came back and then yeah um and, but even so even uh, also is it I feel like Denis Villeneuve is trolling us at this point with how tiny he likes to make his credits and like his titles. <laughs> like they're honestly, 
we were sitting, you know, I don't know, maybe 10 feet away from the screen at most. And they were so tiny. <laughs> we were just like, how? Um, it's, it's getting out of control. But anyway, even so we were blown away by how this looks like, um, even not sitting in an IMAX theater. Uh, it was, it, it is just an incredibly stunning movie. Um, we were softly murmuring curses, uh, about <laughs> how, how it looks at yeah. certain points. Um, and, uh, just, you know, overall very, very impressed, uh, by this movie and, and, get thee to the largest screen that you can safely get yourself to. Mm -hmm, and yeah. here's the thing. Dune on your HBO Max in your house is better than no Dune. I will say that. Yeah. So if if those are your two choices is no Dune or Dune <laughs> at your home, <laughs> right. you, sh you should Dune at your home. Do Dune. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have Dune at your home versus at a theater somewhere, anywhere, for the love of God go to a movie theater and see it there. It is simply not intended to be done the way that I was forced to do it. Um, yeah. But, but uh, yes, and I'm looking forward to going out, you know, as soon as I can and catching it while it's still in theaters and, and catching up on um, what I, the many aspects of the experience <laughs> that I can tell that I missed out on. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for taking one for the team to to bring us that report from the field <laughs> um, <laughs> of the thing not to do. Yes. Yeah, back to you in the studio, Michael. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, cool. So we have the spectrum laid out. Brian, tell me about your experience. Uh, yeah, definitely closer to the Alex side of things. Uh, Cinemark XD, which is not, I wasn't able to see it. IMAX just scheduling again, but I saw it the Thursday before the day it came out, which I think people don't realize that, especially in LA, like, that's you can just see any movie at 6 p.m. Thursday before it comes out. Um, so the theater wasn't packed. It was full, but it wasn't packed. Um, but uh, yeah, just what an immersive experience, as you said, like just being completely shaken literally by the the sound and the music, having this giant floor to ceiling screen um, and uh, and just, yeah, the the visceral yeah, emotional mood experience was just like absolutely flawless. Um, and it, you know, the beginning of the movie is for I'm so used to Denis, Denis Villeneuve's movies being slow and methodical and slowly paced, and you're going to enjoy it anyway. But it's da da da. But then the first 20 minutes of Dune was like, it's Dune, and we're here, <laughs> and it's big and exciting, and you know, like he's he's sticking his hand in the water, but like the music is telling you this is the coolest thing you've ever seen. Um, yeah. <laughs> and but then like inevitably it gets into Denis Villeneuve territory where it's like we have these long scenes and. I'm not quite sure what the big picture is and, and all this kind of thing, but I'm having a good time looking at everything. I'm having a good time listening to all the stuff and watching all the things. Um, so there was just a little bit maybe of uh, not feeling disoriented. I, I very fortunately did not ever feel disoriented with regard to who the characters were mm -hmm. or what the relationship was. But I think the overall macro uh, what are they actually trying to achieve? How does each scene actually support that thing that they are trying to achieve? That felt a little um, meandery to me uh, in in a way that I didn't mind because again, I just love looking at a Daniel <laughs> film um, and just what a cast and everything. You know, just this movie is just so lovely. Um, but I'm very curious to watch, you know, for future viewings because on one hand all those things are going to be make more sense to me the more that I watch it. You know, I've seen, I've never read the book. I saw the David Lynch movie a long time ago. You know, I have basically no context. But so I feel like, oh, right, that thing is this. And just like watching Blade Runner 2049 for the second or third time, you're like, oh, right, right. that's where that fits in. And that's how that. Um, but I also am wondering, am I going to be as excited watching the movie again during some of those more slower meandery scenes, or are they going to start to feel more and more like homework to get to sort of complete the, the task that you are there to complete? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that is not in any way a negative review of this just wonderful film, uh, but it was the only thing that kept me from just being like walking out of the theater going, that's the most amazing movie I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I think there's a lot of things to, to talk about and go from from there. 
I think pacing and exposition are really interesting topics with this movie. Uh, I should say I haven't read the book. I did go on a very long car ride with our producer, Vince Major, uh, <laughs> like coming back from like YouTube headquarters one night. I think it was raining and my head Vince was drunk. I don't know that that's true. Don't hold me to that. <laughs> but he was like, have you ever like read the Dune novels? And I was like, no. And he was like, let me tell you everything about them. <laughs> And so I remember being like enthralled by what he was saying. And I remember mm. none of it. Like going into this movie, I was like, <laughs> I, I literally couldn't tell you one thing about this movie. Like at some point during the movie, I was like, oh, spice. Like Vince said something about spice. <laughs> right. um, so even though I, I apparently had heard a lot about it, I my brain did not recall any of that. But I was surprised by how quickly i was able to get on board with like the big picture like this is what's going on and like this is the mm -hmm. world of there is an emperor out there and he's a jealous man and so he's gonna sabotage this house with these bad people and maybe a very complicated way of doing things i don't quite understand why this was the <laughs> path that was chosen um but I had a good sense of like the households and the, you know, spice is really important. You know, I was thinking about there's lots of comparisons with Star Wars and Dune that go back for forever. But, you know, in Star Wars, you have that opening crawl that's like, here's the TLDR of what's going on. Right. And Dune is like, here's a cool montage where Zendaya is going to tell you all about everything you need to know to kind of get up to speed. And maybe that's part of like the vision that... Um, Paul uh, is having. And so I, I just feel like the way they introduced, you know, the the mechanics of the world and the voice, you know, the magic of this place and all the different organizations and shadows was really effective. While also, like you were saying, Brian, being like, no, we're happening. Like, this is a movie going on. Yeah. Um, and I just found that balance to be uh, really great. And why I think the the first hour of the movie is probably my favorite part. Mm. Like there's mm -hmm. just so much happening and so fun to learn all about that. And then I think it does slow down later on once there's kind of more wandering and the, the, the desert going on. Hmm. I, the more I think about this movie, the more it reminds me in so many ways of Fellowship of the Ring. And I think mm. this really feels, if there eventually is a second or maybe even third Dune film, we may look back on this one as this trilogy's fellowship where mm -hmm. you do have, a kind of an awkward structure where there's not really an ending to the story because we're like just getting started you know we're not even halfway to mordor uh and so you have this kind of wandering final act you know in fellowship we're going to galadriel and now we're just kind of going down a river for a while and i guess we'll have a final orc battle but you know that's that's there's no big climax yeah. really um and and you and i also love a lot of the first half of fellowship because there's just so much setup of the world done so well like it, it it is an amazing uh parallel i think to this movie where both films are in introducing potentially audiences that have no idea about anything in this universe and it, they manage in the first half of these epic films to set up a lot of complexity a lot of rules and different you know types of races or houses or whatever and for for a film to do that while not ever like slowing down or stopping too long in any one place, but just kind of doing it organically as the characters are moving about uh, is really impressive. And I I do feel like if if the vision, the full vision is ever made for, for this, either two movies or three movies, uh, this may feel like a really, like one of the better opening acts ever, <laughs> just because of how well it sets up the rest of the story. Hmm. Yeah, I was actually surprised to learn that it was the first half of the story. That doesn't mean it's not going to be three movies or, or you know, who knows? There's there's tons of Dune literature out there, not just the first book. Right. Um, but I but I agree. I had the same feeling. I know one of our patrons said that, too, um, is that it felt sort of like fellowship. Like we are just getting started. This is the end of the first of three acts. And if it's the first of a, of a two part movie, then th we're at the midpoint, basically. And that's fine too but it did really feel like this is you know this is the first of a, of a three-part story just because it felt like one giant act in and of itself and one of the really quick comparison to fellowship is also like in the meta of the movie like the marketing i remember when fellowship of the ring came out it wasn't really re referred to as fellowship of the ring in the marketing it was lord of the rings like lord right. of the rings mm. is coming out this christmas and it was like de-emphasized that this was like 
the first of three parts just because you're trying to get the uh, like the general right. public to wrap their heads around lord of the rings that's the thing and mm -hmm. so i think similarly a lot of people didn't go into that movie with the preparation of it's just going to stop <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and this is one big story and this is just the first chapter um and so i think there's probably a, a similar shock that's happening for some audiences with dune because the marketing didn't even put the part I mean, part one is in the movie like when the title comes up it says dune part one nowhere in the marketing does it say part one um so i feel like they like they use clips of like sunday being like this is only the beginning mm -hmm. like that right, like right. phrase is in there but like <laughs> you don't take that to be literal if you're watching a trailer <laughs> right. right yeah well so i uh have a lot of thoughts on all of this stuff but i just want to start off by saying that i read the book and have read the book and um what you were saying about exposition i think is very accurate and very impressive which is that um but neither one of the the two friends that i watched this with had seen had read the book at all and neither one of them was remotely lost um and i've definitely talked to a lot of other people and they're like yeah nope got it absolutely got it like spice emperor harkonnens fremen got it i got it <laughs> um and that's that in itself is incredible, uh, considering how sort of dense and bizarro this world is in so many <laughs> yeah. ways. Um, and I was also like, you know, there is something um, that uh, linguistically is kind of unfamiliar um, to an English speaking and especially an American ear. Um, you know, doing the book draws on ling different linguistic influences. And so like the names of things are don't sound English, right? Or American most of the time, except for Duncan, Idaho. We really went for it. Okay? <laughs> right. And Jessica, kind of. La right. The lady Jessica. Yeah. Um, every time I hear Duncan, Idaho, I'm just like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> does he run a potato company? <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, also, I'm real sorry. quick, like that's also the Jason Momoa thing. I know. Of it's sort of like Harrison Ford in Star Wars, where you have that one character who's like, "Why do you guys talk like this?" Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Right. You guys right. sound weird. Right. I'm, um, from, I'm from Orange County. What's going on with you guys? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but anyway, so th I was very, very impressed by that because I was having a Harry Potter feeling as like you know, if you've read all the Harry Potter novels, you go sit in something like Order of the Phoenix or some of the longer. Um, some of the movies that are adapted from a few of the longer Harry Potter books. And if you've read the book, you're just like, would I understand this at all if I hadn't read the book, right? And I think that that's, that's the problem when you have a 400 page novel and you're trying to adapt it into a film, right? You just run into this, like so much has got to hit the cutting room floor. And if that ends up being expository information, good luck, everybody, right? And so, <laughs> and, and it, and in fairness, especially the first 100 pages of Dune, the novel, are exposition. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't read the book, uh, I trust that you've probably heard by this point, it is a little bit of a difficult novel to get into. And the reason for that is because the first 100 pages are nothing but exposition, basically. Um, and it is quite it's quite dense and dry, I would say, actually, in the first 100 pages. And hmm. so... Um, this movie is tackling that problem and overall i would say tackles it very admirably on the other hand i think that uh i i wish that there had been a few changes made there was a lot that was cut but i wish that some hmm. things had been changed that were not exactly changed so there's a lot of expository scenes in dune um that are in my opinion only doing exposition. I think they're doing exposition very well, but I think they're kind of only doing exposition in so many ways. Um, so like, so for example, the scene where he has to fight Josh Brolin's character, um, mm -hmm. nothing is changed really by the end of that scene. It's a setup for the hand-to-hand -hand combat scene that we see at the end of the film. And in fairness, that scene is directly out of the novel. It's basically straight out of the novel and it's also, if you've seen the David Lynch movie as well, it's you get the same scene right in there. It's exactly the same. Um, but that scene really isn't doing anything other than telling us what shields are. And, you know, here's who this Josh Brolin character is. And here's what we need to know about 
hand-to-hand combat in the world of Dune. Um, and so I sort of wish, you know, and the way you can tell that it doesn't really do anything else is because essentially nothing has changed from the beginning of the scene to the end. Mm-hmm. And there are quite a few scenes like that where he like runs up and he's like, Duncan, Idaho. And Jason Momoa was like, hey, son. Hey, buddy. <laughs> my boy. <laughs> and yeah. My boy. And he's like, can I go with you to, to Arrakis? It's it's I w- really want to go. I have all of these feelings about it. And uh, Duncan Idaho is like, nope. He's like, but I really want to go. <laughs> no. And that's the end of that scene. So mm. essentially nothing has changed. We know who Duncan Idaho is. And I'm not saying that's not exposit- not valuable expository work, but it's not actually plot work because Paul wasn't going to Arrakis before that. He's not going to Arrakis after. And the part about the dreams, he could have told it to us in a scene where something actually happened. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was paying attention to that also this time. Of it, it is this weird thing where it feels like these scenes in the hands of somebody else and with different actors and with different music, like could be really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and that <laughs> feeling, that feeling. I was like, this dialogue is very serviceable, but lesser actors would butcher it, and this would be bad. But you right. have eight Oscar winners in your movie right. uh-huh. so they're gonna crush all of it like every every line of it no matter how inane um and what a tribute to them and i feel like the the example that even the first time i saw it, it jumped out at me is in that that fighting scene where you're learning this is how shields work josh brolin has a line where he's basically just saying look audience when the blade goes slowly it goes through the shield but when it goes <laughs> fast it doesn't yeah. but the way he says it there's like this poetry it's almost like he enjoys like right. like talking yeah. about the rhythm of the stance of like you know this ah the slow blade penetrates the shield like <laughs> that's a dumb line. like that could be a really <laughs> bad like okay yeah 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 line but it's done so well that it doesn't take me out of the scene right he also says one of my least favorite lines, and I think maybe Trisha, you brought this up too, uh, in movies, which is, "You just don't get it, do you?" Right <laughs> now, I now I have it was to explain so early a thing in the to movie. You. I was like, yeah. <laughs> right. they're brutal. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> well, and so so many things here. To, so maybe let's talk about performances also in general. Because yeah. as you were saying, there's a million amazing actors. Uh, the, so this was one of the things that was hardest for me to talk about with you guys is when Harvey, Javier Bardem shows up for like five minutes and they have that scene. And then at the end, Javier Bardem leaves and Josh Brolin's like, I don't like that guy. I'm like, no country <laughs> for old men. It's yeah. so, yeah. totally not. Like, and I wanted to bring it up, but I couldn't on the podcast. Right. Also real quick, there's so much weird crossover. We did our accidental, um, uh, Roger Deakins like trilogy with No Country for Old Men and Blade Runner 2049 um, and Skyfall. And then like weirdly, Ana de Armas shows up in No Time to Die, <laughs> which is not Roger Deakins, but it's a next Bond movie. And then Javier Bardem, who was the villain of those of two of those three movies, <laughs> now shows up in the the movie of the director who didn't put him in his movie. It's just like all these weird crossovers where I'm sure a lot of this was just people working together and being like, yes, that's someone we want to work with again. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so I feel like, yeah, let's just talk about performances here a little bit. And to me, the one that really stood out was Rebecca Ferguson. Like, yeah. I did not know she was going to be in this movie. And mm-hmm. she does so much heavy lifting. Like, I feel like so much of the movie works because of her performance and the drama that she brings to the relationship between Paul and the the Jedi women. What are Bene they called? Je- Bene Gesserit. Bene Gesserit. Oh, Bene yes. Gesserit, yeah. And then, yeah. Um, but yeah, just like... I feel like that's another strength of the Denis Villeneuve, you know, thing is that he can do these crazy sci-fi things, but also bring these really believable, grounded mm-hmm. performances that lend so much credibility. Timothy Chalamet, when he's getting his hand like pained in that box, mm-hmm. it was just like it felt like someone would actually like that was a realistic portrayal of what it would be like to be experiencing, you know, immeasurable pain but not being able to do anything about it yes. so, just so many great performances yeah mm-hmm. yeah that that particular sequence i think was when the movie was really settling in for me it's like oh this is good this is a good movie because mm. you have so much subtext just in all the subtleties of rebecca ferguson's performance as she's going to his room to like wake him up and looking really kind of shaken about it and leading him to the uh, uh, the Charlotte Rampling character um, <laughs> and and just the 
the sense of dread mm -hmm. hanging over her performance throughout the entire sequence. It like she single handedly is basically telling us the stakes without telling us anything, like just because of how exactly. she's reacting to the scene. And and I just it's it's great if you want to check out there's a Vanity Fair kind of director's close up video with Denis Villeneuve it basically breaking apart that sequence, the the box sequence. Mm -hmm. And it just it just reminds me why I love him so much as a director, because it, the, he he like stops the the you know the sequence every like two seconds to talk about something because <laughs> every single frame has so much thought put into it he talks about the performances and the design of the box and the design of the costumes and the design of the room they're in and it's just wow you like there's so much love and passion and thoughtfulness put into every frame of this movie and that's i think it's part of why it has a cumulative effect of like this is just good in a way that few things are because it's being made by someone who loves this thing so much, he's willing to like over plan every single frame of the film because his like teenage self, as he talks about a lot, he has this teenage self that envisioned this film when he was 13 and he has to mm. honor that. Aww. And that and that teenage self, he he it's it's funny, he has like these kind of like, you know, translated English words. He, he always says he was like a like an authoritarian or like he's a, he's a very like imperialistic authoritarian director who like demands the best. And so we had to live up to that 13 year old self. Um, mm. And, and I, I feel like he did in this movie. Like it does feel yeah. like he made a movie for teenage me as well, where it's just, I'm going to blow your freaking mind and shake you. And, <laughs> and, he, and he just did it, you know, because the also like he, he's, he's a subtle director. A lot of the times, like he does hold yeah. back. He, he, he likes to be, to test your patience and to really be quiet. And in this movie, I think he did honor his 13 year old self where he's like, no, 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 we're not going to be quiet. Like we're going to be screaming at you literally with this score. Uh, it's not going to be a subtle movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, on the subject of, um, of casting and performances, uh, Timothée Chalamet, I think is, is such an interesting choice. So I think I definitely, when I first saw that he was playing Paul, I was like, okay. And, you know, to young me, Kyle McLaughlin was a grown up and to now me, like to <laughs> tell me it's like this child. Um, but also he is not, you know, even age aside, he is not the sort of like sturdiest of frames and that kind of thing, which is, which is referenced, <laughs> you know, you put on some muscles. I did no. Um, <laughs> but, but then I think about a, um, uh, a Daniel Radcliffe or a Mark Hamill in Harry exactly. Potter or Star Wars, where it's like you you cast the person who is the sort of, you know, weakling is not the right word, but you know what I mean, the sort of boyish person, so that you can see this transformation. And I think like, I that's what I love about Return of the Jedi is you see Luke now, like both Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker are now evolved into this like badass thing um and then you have a movie like we talked about with black swan where natalie portman just you know she just can play both the white swan and the black swan so she so you can have that transformation over the course of one movie if you have an actor who can who can has that range um and it was only at the end battle in this movie where i was like okay i'm, I'm starting to see now how chalamet is kind of turning into a little bit of a badass we are seeing like you start him here and then you where what end point do you get to hopefully we have dune two or dunes uh dollar sign um so <laughs> <laughs> so that we can see hopefully even more of a transformation because i think he's a great actor but i didn't see that big of a transformation which they weren't even going for in this movie of course but i did mm -hmm. see a hint of that of like if we keep the story going you are going to see him continue to not just be the you know harry potter movie one like i'm a what you know just sort of like the the little guy mm -hmm. I, and i think in fairness to the to the source material uh i believe he is like a teenager right he's like 15 yeah he is so, uh -huh. so yeah in in some ways there's almost no actor that could do this role like Timothy Chalamet, because he is an adult who looks 15, but <laughs> yeah. as the like story progresses, can like become an adult. Like he, right. in, in an individual body, he could be both a teenager and an adult eventually. And I mm -hmm. think it is really, a, in a lot of ways, it is a classic hero's journey coming of age story, as far as I understand it. So, you know, what a better, what better actor do we have right now to, to, to embody that than, than this like, you know, boy man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely agree with all of that. And I really want to uh, circle back to Paul and Paul's arc, 
in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and circle back to the like, yeah, myth of the one kind of coming of age, like, you know, the sort of monomyth things that uh, we've been comparing this to, like Harry Potter and Star Wars, which I, th- I think are, we'll get there. <laughs> really fair <laughs> comparisons um, because Frank Herbert was trying to do something like that or uh, trying to uh, employ some of those tropes for, for very deliberate reasons. Um, but on the subject of casting, full agree about Rebecca Ferguson. Uh, the Lady Jessica is maybe to me like the most important person in the novel, especially in the first half of the novel. And so much hangs around her and her decisions and what she chooses to do. Um, and I think Rebecca Ferguson gives a lot of depth to a character who doesn't quite get enough screen time, to be honest. Um, my my overall not critique, but just sort of like, it is what it is, is that you're trying to cram 200 pages of a 400 page novel into a movie that is on the long side, but still there's a lot of plot to get through. And so character moments are a little hard to come by. Um, And the movie does the best that it can. I think one of the loveliest scenes is the one with Oscar Isaac right at the beginning. And uh, to my recollection, it isn't from the book. Um, there is, you know, there's obviously a scene between Paul and his father, uh, but it, I don't think it is is quite like that. A lot of the stuff about like the bullfighting, which the Denis Villeneuve decided to really fixate on as a symbol, yeah. and I think as a fairly af- effective symbol, is pretty much is sort of just very uh, tertiary kind of you know, subtext over there thing in the book. Um, And and it's really brought to the forefront here in a way that I think is very effective. We've talked about symbols being shorthand. And I think if you need a shorthand symbol for what the house of Atreides means and is, Mm. um, and to, and to Paul means this is my father, right. Or like, this is my legacy. Um, then the bull and the bullfighting is a great choice there. And so that scene in the graveyard in Scotland, uh, (laughs) Look, Caladan looks like Scotland. Maybe um, from the Nor- Norway. Which makes sense okay. when they have bagpipes, apparently, for That's the yeah. House of Atreides. So that's all I'm going to say about the bagpipes. Um, I noticed <laughs> They're loud, bagpipes. is the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> loud bagpipes. I noticed some bagpipes in this film. <laughs> um, uh, anyway. But I, I think that that's a really lovely example. Oscar Isaac's performance in that scene is is really touching. We haven't really gotten to see Oscar Isaac play a dad. And mm-hmm. he's a good dad in this. Mm-hmm. And you have to have, in order for Paul to feel dimensional, for there to feel like there are stakes on what happens to Paul, we have to care about the house of Atreides. And, and that's just sort of like an important uh, fact. And so by really focusing on Duke Leto Atreides and what he means to Paul as a father, but also he has to be like at really admirable, right? Like we hate the Harkonnens, they're colonizers and like they're, they're brutal and they, um, they're bad to the people of Arrakis. Right. And so we have to see that, that Leto Atreides wants to do better and is, in a hard situation, but he's smart and he's savvy and his men respect him. And like all of these things that we admire about leaders, you have to kind of pack it into this character that you're going to lose midway Mm -hmm. through the movie. It's a tall order to do. And the casting of Oscar Isaac's really smart, but a lot of those early scenes with him are also very well done. Yeah. Yeah. That, that scene that you're talking about where they first talk and they're in the graveyard Mm -hmm. essentially was kind of the first moment one of the first moments where I really like leaned forward and was like, oh, movie, you're going to try to be like have dimensionality to you because mm-hmm. the how how both characters are designed, uh, Paul and Leto, uh, are are very recognizable, but just a little bit. There's mm-hmm. something a little bit special to them, I think, where like with Paul, you know, he's Luke Skywalker ish and that he's like a young prince ish person, but he's not like, I want to go to the Tashi station to pick up power. Camp. Like he doesn't have <laughs> yeah. that aspect to him. He's like, I don't really want to do this today. I prefer not to. But like when he's called to do it, he does it. So he has that reluctance thing, but not in an annoying way, which I appreciated. And then with his father, I the the at the end of that scene in the graveyard, there's there's like a conventional movie version of that that right. ending where he's like, what if I'm not 
the next one. Yes, uh, I noticed and, this too. It's really beautiful. Yeah, and like that that Leto says, like you know, regardless, you're still going to be the only thing I ever needed you to be, mm-hmm. like my son. And it's like, oh, okay, there's like a relationship here, and this person, he, you know, as a leader, understands the importance of what they're doing and is after power and money and all these things but also cares about his family cares about people it's a little bit ned starkey in game of thrones oh he's very Mm -hmm. ned starkey yeah Yeah, where it's like the honorable but like still tough leader and yeah as you're saying trisha oscar isaac it was so fun to see him play that because he brought so much of that and and i think my favorite scene is is him when he's piloting uh the ship and they go down to like rescue the spice miners like you get to see him also be this pilot like yeah uh, just it's sad that he's not in more of it but i feel like they got to do a lot with him and every scene that he was in he he definitely brought it for yeah the the bad part about killing oscar isaac and jason momoa is that you no longer have oscar isaac and jason momoa so you know denis if you're listening you better have a a streep or a coleman or an old man or a (laughs) few up your sleeve for part two because we need we need some more of that um but uh, but yeah, it's funny because we have seen Oscar Isaac play dad at least once in Drive. Uh, where he's like a strung out oh. like criminal. Wait, Oscar um, Isaac's in Drive. Oh, Michael, it's like a small uh, <laughs> small role, yeah. yeah right. Um, but uh, but yeah, you speaking of uh, roles like that, we often see Oscar Isaac as like the strung out ex machina, right? Like the sort of he plays the the wild card so well even in star wars yeah. he's just a, he's like a, a a leading you know good guy but he's still the wild card the the joke cracker and it was nice to see him in just a very grounded mature performance so yeah i totally agree um and and yeah the the relationship stuff again i feel like i really got to know these characters and the relationship with each other very early into the movie and that just felt nice and and sort of warm to be with them for the rest of the ride It is a little unfortunate that savvy moviegoers, I'm sure, though, like the minute that that they have that really touching moment where he's like, you're my son. That's all I ever needed you to be. I was like, oh, he's toast. But (laughs) (laughs) if you had a bad relationship with your dad, that dude would live the whole movie. (laughs) He's so nice to you. He's definitely toast. It's like whenever whenever character says, you know, oh, this is my pet turtle. He's the most important thing to me. You're like, uh oh, ah. <laughs> an hour, an hour and 10 minutes from now, we're going to have some bad news about yep. that turtle. If you listen to Beyond the Screenplay on Spotify, you may have noticed that the episodes now have video accompanying the audio. These are the same video podcasts that we release on the Beyond the Screenplay YouTube channel. As you can imagine, recording high quality video on four different computers for hour long plus episodes results in some very big files. Transferring big files like this to someone collaborating with you remotely can be a huge problem because most cloud file transfer solutions limit you to just a couple hundred gigabytes, but not massive. Massive is a file sharing service that lets media professionals quickly transfer terabytes of data to anyone in the world over the cloud. With Massive, there are no limits to the amount of data you can send. And Massive has 150 servers worldwide, which means whoever you're sending the file to will be able to download it at a maximum unthrottled speed. To learn more and to sign up for Massive, head to massive.io slash beyond dash the dash screenplay. When you sign up at that link, you'll get 100 gigabytes free towards your transfer. That's massive.io slash beyond dash the dash screenplay for 100 gigabytes free. The link is also in the show notes. Now, back to the episode. It's interesting because you guys are talking about more of just like a generic movie trope, but it's it's a really interesting challenge that Villeneuve had with this film because Dune is the thing that a lot of people were copying in the things everybody knows. So Star Wars yes. right, yep. uh, is mm-hmm. copying so many Dune things. And, and there's just so many elements of the monomyth that, you know, this is a sci-fi monomyth. And I feel like every other sci-fi monomyth that followed kind of stole from Dune or had to use part of what mm-hmm. Dune began. And, yeah. uh, and so when you're making Dune now in 2021, for an audience that has seen all these kind of Dune right. clones, exactly. um, how do you make something that feels totally original? And yes, it still is doing the monomyth, which we're all familiar with, but how do you make the world not just feel like Tatooine or Star Wars? And right. I think that's something I'm really impressed with in this movie is 
there's something that feels new and fresh about it. it the music and the the visual design of the ships and the way that they're things, cool yeah the way mm -hmm. things move through space it, it it doesn't feel like we're going just to a generic star wars space like there's something right. fresh and new and also timeless about the visual effects and the way things look it doesn't feel like a trendy oh here's like what we're doing this year in sci-fi visuals it's uh right he's making something for the ages and uh but without just falling back on the default star wars or star trek thing right mm. Also, fun fact, David Lynch turned down directing Return of the Jedi to re to direct Dune, wow. which then ended up being his like least favorite experience working on a movie ever. And he walked away from it and disowned it, basically. But there could have been a David Lynch directed Return of the Jedi, which what on God's green earth would that have been? <laughs> could have changed everything. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> well, and as you're saying, Alex, you know how it, it does feel so unlike things that we've already seen despite being very similar to things that we've already already seen and that is a feat and that's one of the things again that the, the sound designers were talking about when they did mm -hmm. that round table so again people check this out where you know they started from scratch like they don't use any kind of library thing it's like go figure out what all of this might sound like and he starts working with the picture editor and the sound designers all those people very early on in the process, like before they start shooting, when they're shooting, he flies them out to set. And most movies, it's like, we shot a movie, quick, bring in some sound people to like yeah. put some sound in in the last three weeks, and then it's over. And he talks specifically about, you know, the first time he made a, a movie that had a budget, that's kind of how it happened. And he was like, no, I don't, I can't make a movie like this where I'm just kind of band-aiding, you know, sound on it. Um, and so it's, it's cool because I think he's making movies in a way that lots of people wish they could. And somehow he gets to where it's like, no, we're going to have the sound team on the whole time. So like we're shooting things and they're designing sound effects that's getting sent to the picture editor who's editing dailies so that we can watch it and send that to the visual effects people who can come up with the look for the shield. And then that's going to influence how we shoot the scene. And so it's just it all is like working together and also giving time to experiment and find something new because you can't rely on finding something new if you don't have time. And so having that time to experiment and get things wrong is what lets you arrive at something that feels fresh. Right. And I do want to say one of the things that just is stunning and I, I, I really don't know how they managed to pull it off is that there's so much about Dune the book and especially the David Lynch movie that is so goofy that mm. it just, you cannot take any part of it seriously in so many ways. Like you're like spice, what? And like things have goofy names and like things are just goofy ideas at times. Giant sand worms. There's, there's giant sand worms. Sure. <laughs> the spice is like a drug and like you've got the shields that do what now? And then like this guy. I assume like, like the dragonfly copters are in the book also. Um, I don't think they're described quite in okay. that much detail. Like I didn't have a good okay. I picture in my head of what the they're called thropters. Again, mm. a little goofy. Um, <laughs> I didn't have a good picture of what those looked like in my head. So I, mm. I don't know, but, okay. but I think the fact that so much of this film is not goofy and does not feel even a tiny bit goofy is because of the sound design. I think mm. that, you know, there's a mm. real difference. Like imagine, um, you know, this is a very corny example. We talk sometimes in sound design or, or just sound about like Mickey mousing, where mm -hmm. like when, you know, something, somebody hits somebody, it goes whoop, right? Like, or those goofy kind of sounds. Mm -hmm. Those are really extreme examples. But if things don't sound like they have weight mm -hmm. and, you know, dimensionality to them, if they don't sound like they're in the room with the characters, if they don't sound like um, things that we're familiar with but can't place, right? That's because that's what you kind of need. Think about Jurassic Park where the dinosaurs don't sound like the dinosaurs that we know in Jurassic Park, right? Where the mm. T-Rex somehow doesn't have that roar that we are familiar with now. They are creating iconic sounds. And if we didn't have those sounds, we would not believe any of it. So in right. sci-fi world, sound design is 
even more key. And I think that, uh, so the David Lynch movie example, I talked about that scene where um, Paul and, I'm sorry, what's Josh Brolin's character's uh, name? Gurney. Gurney Halleck, thank you. Um, when, yeah, when Paul and Gurney Halleck are fighting or they're in their training sequence and that's when we first see the shields. That scene is in the David Lynch movie and I will tell you that the sound is part of the reason there are also very dated special effects in that scene. Um, but it, if they had sound that sold us on it, right? We believe our ears more than we believe our eyes most of the time. So also <laughs> thinking about the Harkonnens and um, the Baron, right? There's a lot about the Baron that is so menacing and evil. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is in the sound design, the sound of the rooms and the places that he inhabits. He also is up on his suspensors that make him fly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but again, that's goofy. And somehow it feels terrifying in this movie. And I think to Denis Villeneuve's credit, it is, it's production design, but it's also sound design. And Stellan Skarsgård helps also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like 100% with what you're saying, but I was just so confused because I didn't know he was in this movie. And then I saw <laughs> that being and heard his voice and it took me a long time to understand what was happening. Yeah. Uh, he also does like the Marlon Brando at the end of like Apocalypse yeah. Now with like the so bald Apocalypse head. And the, yeah. <sighs> like, well, and also uh, coming up out so of the great. goop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's very menacing. Um, well, and so I'm kind of curious, you know, there's so much to talk about in Dune. I... What do we want to happen next, or what do we think is what do we think is going on? Is kind of a question I have because that was something I was left with the second time where I got to the end and I was like, oh man, yeah, this ride was great. It was so cinematic and immersive. I'm so into the story, but what's happening? Like, is Paul a good guy? What are these visions? He's having visions of like Zendaya killing him, but also not Trisha. You know, so you can't say. Uh, okay. But <laughs> I'm just I'm I'm I guess I'm I'm wondering, like, do we want three parts to this or does it feel like whatever's going to happen, there's enough time for it to happen in a part two? Because the idea of a, a part three to me seems like dragging it all out. We're like, this this mm -hmm. does feel like a good midpoint. Paul has made a turning point, but maybe it was the wrong decision. It's kind of unclear. So now I want to see part two. But yeah, what do you guys think? Just to clarify, the part three is more of like a possibility and it wouldn't be mm -hmm. trying to divide the first book up any further. It would be adapting Dune Messiah, which is the sequel. So it wouldn't be trying to like do a Hobbit where it's like we were going to make two Split parts, it. but now <laughs> we're doing yeah. three parts. It okay. would be actually like more story material uh, to adapt from. Um, and I think it's kind of I think Denis Villeneuve is taking it one movie at a time at this point. Like he always knew he wanted to make at least the two parts. And I think it's up in the air if a third part would make sense after part two. Mm -hmm. um, but to your question, I think he did a masterful job of making me desperately want more by the end of this film because uh, just the little tease of showing the the Fremen writing the worm. <laughs> and, and I was like, I was wondering earlier when when the uh, what's her name? The the change oh, so cool. guardian person. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I don't know what her name is, but but when she she Liet puts, Kynes. Liet yeah. Kynes, yeah. yeah. When she has the thumper out and then she gets mm -hmm. her hooks out and she's like waiting for it. To, I'm like, oh, wait, what is she going to do? <laughs> and they kill her, of course. But um, that just hinted to me that like, oh, wait, this this world gets crazy. Like we haven't even seen the world of the Fremen at all yet, really. We've just seen them kind of mm. coming out of the shadows and retreating. What is their world actually like? Those underground cities. There's like a whole other half to this planet we haven't seen yet. So I just got excited for more world building, honestly. Just I I I sense there's a ton more uh ahead of us as far as this world. And I think I'm just curious to see what you know what where the hero's journey goes. Cause I have heard whisperings about that there's something a little bit subversive about the Dune hero's journey and this idea of a messiah and you know the Bene Gesserit coming and kind of planting the idea of a messiah, which is self-fulfilling prophecy. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to see yeah, what the, the novel and the movies actually are saying about the monomyth by the end of this story. And where does Paul go? And, and is it a tragic story? Does it end up being war that is bad and he's responsible for it? Or is he the classic hero? I'm, I'm really curious. So mm -hmm. I, I just can't wait. I'm upset that it hasn't been greenlit yet. I just need them to be, <laughs> I need them to be making it right now. 
because I need it soon. It could be it could be greenlit by the time this episode drops. Right. Very, good by the way. Very good point. Very good point. I bet it will be. Uh, yeah, for me, I mean, plot wise, I don't having only seen the movie once and having not read the book, I, I can't really say about, oh, I hope that they do this and I hope that whatever. Um, but in terms of just what I want from a second movie, as you were saying, Alex, we get a lot of tastes in this movie. You know, we get a really cool sandworm sequence where we don't really see it. And then we get one where we do see it, but it doesn't really do anything. And um, and it's like, yeah, wanting to see more of that, wanting to see more of all these things that have been sort of teased. The action was sometimes frustrating in this movie because they would build up to this action sequence. You know, the two armies going, one's going down the steps and da da da, and they're coming towards each other. And then it's like, edit, 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 and cut away to a different scene. I'm like, wait, what, that was like, that was like a battle you were setting up. And then we get, I don't know, 15 seconds of some like really some smash cuts and then we are off to a new thing. So maybe more of that, you know, a, a, a real big battle that feels like you can see the whole battlefield or whatever. Like, I have no idea if that is even, you know, in the cards in terms of the story, but I just want to see the things that we've been shown, but in bigger scope and bigger scale, spending more time on them. Um, even any sort of like special powers people have the voice, right? Like mm -hmm. all of this stuff, like let's see all of the, all of these things happen, but with a little bit more time spent on them. Um, and also don't have, a character say let's fight like demons in the trailer when that's not what the line is they <laughs> he says they fight like demons which kind of makes sense let's fight like demons doesn't really make any sense how does a demon fight that happens but a lot least, though in trailers. i know but like the, <laughs> but like that. to literally like a, a an expositional scene where Jason Momoa was just explaining something that happened is used in the trailer as like, we're going to go kick their asses right this second. And I was like, what a strange reusage of a line and mishmashing. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, don't do that with the second trailer. Just like, you know. You got to get the Aquaman fans in the theater right. though. So. Well, right. and, and, and the Zendaya fans, you know, who you know, she's very heavily featured in the trailer and she's, right. Right. she's just like, there in his dreams and then teased at the very end in like one scene right. yeah. which is which is pretty funny if you know you you came to the theater for like for the her. zendaya movie yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> well michael i want to hear from you about the answer to your own question um and then i want to come back to to paul and paul's arc for a minute but yeah mm. what okay. do you want from dune part two i uh everything everything above everything that everyone's just said i agree with um and I feel like, like you were saying, Alex, I do get a little bit of sense of subversiveness with the, you know, the visions of mm -hmm. Zendaya's character who probably has a name. Um, Chani. Chani, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and I feel like I, there's something about the Denis Villeneuve style that I, I feel like he has, this is like its final form. Like he has nailed it and it has arrived <laughs> and it is great. But it also is still feels like a little bit held back by the sort of cynical, like everything's got to be a little bit like distant for us to buy into it and believe it thing. And this isn't even like a critique of it or the movie. It's just like a an, ob an observation that I've had and, and people comparing it to Star Wars a little bit and all that. And like Star Wars is, you know, goofy and and fun and a totally different kind of movie but there is a bit more like life in it and i guess i'm curious if like as they maybe as we spend more time with the fremen maybe there can be more life put into the movie like maybe things don't have to totally be kind of in this you know very low dynamic range visually where it's like there's bright gray and there's dark gray and there's like <laughs> a little bit of like kind of yellow and a little bit of gray um so I feel like I, I want to go back to this world, but I want more like life and character, like deep connection stuff. So that's what I'm hoping mm -hmm. in, in the following, the following part. Yeah. So this, this all brings me back to like, kind of one of the things that I walked away feeling, uh, which was just that this movie seems scared of like the monomyth aspects of itself in some ways where like so frank herbert when he wrote dune was interested in the monomyth aspects particularly in world religion um and like 
how that's used for political play and power, right? Where it's like, if you can give people a messiah, then you automatically have like essentially a military leader or a political leader as well. And, Mm. you know, um, world religions do this constantly where there's like one, you know, sort of messianic or like Christ figure or like central prophet or whatever it is. And that's kind of like who everyone can, you know, um, worship. And so, um, in, there are plenty of myths about the myths that uh, employ the same thing that are not necessarily, um, you know, followed with actual religious devotion, but that we still, for some reason, you know, um, as humans, it kind of feels like it it unlocks something in us that we just sort of like believe in because this is something that's like universally uh, existent, right? Like sort of across all cultures and like many, many different time periods, there are these monomyths, um, which is what Joseph Campbell's book is about, uh, which I strongly mm-hmm. recommend. Um, so Frank Herbert was interested in this and he was interested in interrogating this and, and sort of bringing to light some of the problematic, um, you, you know, Im- problematic uh, implications of the monomyth. And so, you know, the fact that everyone continually is telling Paul that he is special and he is the hero and he is the Messiah and all of this stuff. And um, I think is uh, is definitely uh, from the book and, and adapted very faithfully from the book. However, one thing the book does really well that the movie doesn't necessarily seem interested in doing is lining up sort of like two paths for Paul, mm. where I feel like when we talk about a character arc and a, an arc of change, what we are expecting is we know what this road looks like and we know what this road looks like. And we know what it means for the character on their personal journey to choose to go this way or to choose to go that way. And unfortunately for Denis Villeneuve, the p- one problem that the book has is that so much stuff just happens to Paul. Mm-hmm. And Paul doesn't necessarily make a lot of decisions, especially at the beginning of Dune. It's like, so the plot by the Harkonnens and the Emperor to like overthrow House Atreides has nothing to do with Paul. I mean, it kind of right. does, but it happens to him. It's not mm-hmm. something that he chooses. He's not the person driving the plot. Like he survives this movie is kind of right. like the, the thing <laughs> right. that you can say about Paul. Um, but he doesn't end up being pressured into a lot of super difficult choices. And the choices that he does make, we kind of don't understand what they mean. Like the movie doesn't really Mm. do a good job of setting up for us what they mean. So before the box scene, we don't really know what the box is about or what it means. It's like, if you take your hand out of the box, you die. If you leave your hand in the box, something. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Pain. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But it doesn't tell us like, we don't know, you know, turns out the Bene Gesserit have, uh, they have been, crossing bloodlines and manipulating, you know, like all these royal houses to try to create a messiah figure for generations. But we don't know that before that box scene. So that's a test for Paul. Paul is making a choice. We don't know what the choice means um, until theoretically much later. But we also, even when we know what the choice means, okay, so maybe the Bene Gesserit mother thinks that he could be the one. She's not sure that he is the one. Um, We still don't, know what that means for Paul. He's not even in the scene where like the Bene Gesserit mother, Reverend mother tells uh, Lady Jessica, like he could be the one. And it's like, what? Um, anyway. It's there at the end because then they yeah, whisper he was, across. He was listening. Yeah, oh, so yeah. they whisper oh, across 15 feet in uh, the yeah, fog. Okay. Yes, a lot of whispering in this movie. Uh, yeah, there <laughs> is. Anyway, I, I just think that, you know, to again compare to A New Hope, when Luke turns off his navigating camera or whatever, his targeting camera. And was like, we hear Obi-Wan. And he's like, use the force, Luke. We know exactly what that means. We understand the choice that Luke is making. Mm -hmm. This movie does not have a use the force, Luke moment. Um, We're like, he's going to fight this guy. Well, he's never killed anybody before. Does that mean he is a messiah? Is he choosing to be the Messiah? Does it have to do with maybe this is the way? I feel like and part of it is we spend 10 minutes. It feels like 10 whole minutes of this movie watching Zendaya walk around like with her (laughs) hair blowing and like watching Paul's visions unfold. And we are they're not explained to us in any way. And I'm not sure that we need that much of them, to be honest. Like you could have saved probably half of that time and done something else with it. Like explain to us what some of Paul's choices might mean. And Mm -hmm. I guess it might feel like I'm nitpicking um, 
you know, but as someone who is like at the end of the day, one wants to know what a, a movie is about. Um, I, I feel like so much happens in this movie, but I, I'm not quite sure I know what it's about. Mm -hmm. Um, and also so much happens in this movie that I feel like it also doesn't land. There are a lot of moments that don't land with the gravity that I wish that they did. So like the doctor's betrayal seems like it should be a thing that lands with a lot of gravity. And I don't hardly know anything about him. Um, Mm -hmm. and a lot of other, like there are a lot of other little moments like that, that I just feel, um, we just don't get to spend enough time with some of those characters to, to really appreciate some of that. So um, I'm not trying to complain. I just, I think that this is a problem that Denis Villeneuve inherited from the book. Mm-hmm. And um, in so many ways, this is such a good adaptation of the book. <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. I wish it was not quite so faithful. <laughs> right. Yeah. For better or worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're pointing out why that final scene, one of the reasons why that final scene doesn't land for me, because there are, I agree that the there are some dramatic moments and moments that are supposed to be very emotional that aren't quite there. But but for the most part, were emotional enough for me. Like the betrayal sure. was like, I get it. Like I've seen them interact enough to be like, he liked him, and this is sad. So like it was enough. But I do feel like at the the finale of the movie is this fight where I am confused about what it means for Paul, like you're saying. Right. And he has a vision where he dies and the voices are saying like, yes, you need to die for this to work. But then they also say taking a life is taking your own life. It's all very confusing. And I feel like maybe that's intentional. Paul's probably kind of confused about it, but it did leave me uh, a little less well-footed when understanding what I was supposed to be like rooting for emotionally in those moment, moments, unlike other moments in the movie. Well, exactly. And this movie is so concerned about not losing us when it comes to world building. But I wish they would treat me like I'm a little dumber when it comes to theme and character art. <laughs> right? Sure. Like, sure. Could you just explain it a little more? Like, <laughs> uh, like I, if it was like, well, you know, when Paul has that vision of the war. And he's like, it's a war. Everyone's chanting my name. Everyone's chanting my father's name. Millions of people are dying. If that's not a future you want, Paul, then I need someone to specifically say like, you know, it's like peace or war. And like (laughs) taking a life leads to war. And so then when he like chooses to kill that guy at the end, I'm like, oh, he's on the path to the war. Like put, put the, do it all the way. (laughs) A little bit more. Yeah. A little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to, third this sentiment of you know that is the one part of the movie that feels like it's so important because it's it is the finale of this first half and and i totally agree i don't know what it means in that moment for for him to kill a man and it and it obviously does mean something and it is this pivot point for his character his midpoint essentially uh but we do we haven't been given that line trisha like you know yeah taking a life means this you will forever be changed into this once you take a life. Right. Nobody nobody said those words to him. And so I don't have that, oh, this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's, it's unfortunate. But in, in, in some ways, you know, this might also be a casualty of this truly being half a movie. I think it would still right. be nice. Sure. It would still be nice for the midpoint to be meaningful in and of itself. But it, it may only be meaningful upon reflection <laughs> once you've seen where he ends up. Right. And you realize, oh, that moment meant this now that i've seen his whole journey and we just have to wait hopefully not too many years to see to see where he ends up yeah yeah time will tell Mm -hmm. why don't we move to lessons so what lessons we're going to take away from dune brian do you want to start us off sure uh it's funny trisha that you brought up the josh brolin uh sort of training scene um because that was something i was thinking about like, I think we all remember that scene and it's uh, it, there's something very simple about it. It's just two people fighting each other um, and you're learning about their relationship and, and, and like there's just dialogue. But there's you know, it's sort of like the, the Morpheus, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Neo fight where it's just like, oh, OK, I'm watching a fight scene, but I'm also getting exposition and stuff. And I totally agree with you that those exposition scenes should also have plot movement and it's unfortunate that they don't but what i did love about not only that scene i felt like every we talk about um 
that your scene should do more than one thing, you know, and um, they weren't necessarily doing more than one thing in the sense that they were often only doing exposition, but they were doing two to three different kinds of exposition every time. And yeah. I, like for those first 20 minutes of the movie um, and, you know, that that scene in particular, it's like, here's a new character. Here's Paul's relationship with him. Uh, here's how combat works in this world, the whole shield thing and everything. And because Paul is not, you just don't get it, do you? Because Paul <laughs> is not appreciating the severity of the stakes, Gurney has to explain to him who these people are and why they are dangerous and what the history is. So it's like you're getting world building, you're getting history. Um, and it does feel a little exposition dumpy during during that you don't get it thing. It's like, oh, they're doing, they're telling us the audience right now. But again, you inject conflict in there. It makes it more interesting to watch. Um, but then I think that what all of that did for me was that first 20, 30 minutes did so much work in telling me, here's who all the characters are. Here's their relationship. Here's a general sense of how the world works that then it allowed the rest of the movie to be a little meandery because I still had a strong sense of the characters and their relationship. So then when Paul is with his mother, I'm like, oh, I know their relationship. When when Paul's father dies, I'm like, I, I know what this is going to mean to Paul. You know, like I am very connected to all these characters. Um, so yeah, it would have been nice if those exposition scenes were also moving the plot forward. And that's maybe sometimes why I felt on a macro level, where are we going? Where is this story actually headed? But at the same time, I thought they was really well done in terms of stacking exposition on top of exposition. Here's a new character. You're going to learn who they are, mm -hmm. what the relationship is. And also they are going to tell you some information about the world that you don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to kind of continue from there because that was essentially my lesson. It's just the, the, the first 30 minutes of this movie do so much, have so much exposition, as we're saying, but also are there's enough drama happening that I'm still drawn in. Um, and so, yeah, everything you just said, Brian, and the other little moment that I wanted to point out is uh, like essentially the first scene you see with um, Paul and his mother, Jessica, where they're at the, the dinner voice? table. It's so yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. It's so cool. It's so good. And it's very smart, I think, to put that as early in the movie as possible. Yep. Because as we've talked about, like there's like a, as audience, our brains are more plastic to weird ideas <laughs> earlier in the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when that scene started, I was like a little bit like weirded out, like, wait, what? There's some there's some power in this world where if you just kind of speak weird, you can make people <laughs> do stuff like Jedi. that's to your point, Trisha, kind of like a goofy thing. Yeah. Jedi ish. Um, but I think because it's so early in the movie, it's like, you know, planting a stake in the ground. I'm like this is a fundamental part of this universe. We're going to highlight it from the very beginning like you're meeting this character you're seeing their relationship and you're also learning how this thing works uh i think was another specific example of how to do if you're gonna have to do a bunch of exposition that was a good choice made about when and how to do that particular kind of exposition yeah for a movie that introduces weird concepts very late into it uh stay tuned for our episode on what lies beneath coming up soon <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes yes indeed um awesome and i i don't want to shout out the this sound design thing too much but that's one of the they talk yeah. about the voice a lot and how that was actually mm. a pretty late thing that they arrived at was like we're gonna have it the voice is going to be out of sync and it's not going to be the character's voices like the the main I, the first thought you would have is like well we're going to process the voice of the actor a little bit and make it sound weird and that'll be how it works but because they had so much time to experiment they were like well what if we do weird stuff instead and so we're gonna like make it out of sync and we're gonna cast a bunch of people to come in and do like a bunch of other like actors performing it and it's actually gonna be the voices of the ancestors that you're hearing so it's not the actor love it yeah mm. so it's just like that's another like specific example of like time to experiment do it wrong find the great thing is is also or do it so fine great. and then find the awesome way right, right. Yeah, exactly right yeah, yeah. and a great example of how if you don't do it well it's goofy it takes the audience out of the world if you do it yeah. well it's one of the coolest things in your movie right, right. Yeah. yeah absolutely trisha what's your lesson yeah so um I was standing in in line to get some food at a camping trip that I was at this weekend. <laughs> and I was talking to a friend of mine about Dune. 
And I was offering a very similar critique to the one that I just offered about the themes and the character's journey. And like, they just didn't really put the pieces together for me. And like, da, da, da. And I was like, and a lot of stuff happens to him. He doesn't make a lot of choices. And, and a bunch of people standing around were listening to me and they were like, this sounds like a terrible movie. And I was like, no, it's really good. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and... And then, you know, I explained a little bit. I was like, no, it's just like, it's this epic thing. It's like Star Wars, it's like Lord of the Rings. It like looks incredible. It'll just knock you over. And, uh, and I was like, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't really have a character arc. And like, sometimes it, it's like kind of rushed and, and things are, and they're like, this sounds like a bad movie. I'm like, no, it's really good. <laughs> like, go see it. Um, and so my lesson is just like, um, I'm a freak of nature about... <laughs> about theme and like for some reason when i process a movie that's like not all i come away with but like i'm listeners of the show already know that that i'm like very uh obnoxious about this you know sort of like what a movie boils down to in a sentence in terms of what it's about and and um what i'm here to say is that not everyone and slash maybe um 99 of all people are not me <laughs> <laughs> and this movie is an incredible film in spite of everything that i just said uh and a really triumphant adaptation of an insanely difficult book um and even if it has sort of its little cynical uh shield up in 2021 it certainly is one of the better epics um, of the last couple of decades and yeah. um, sincerely congratulating Denis Villeneuve and everyone who was involved in making it. Not that they need my congratulations. They, <laughs> uh, as a group, have a large pile of Oscars. But, um, <laughs> and hopefully pick up a couple more uh, for this film. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just like if you make a movie, if you make the hell out of a movie um, in every single possible other way that you can, um, a couple of little stumbles here and there, on your character arc are are not going to get noticed. I could easily watch this movie six more times, and were I not precisely me, um, I would not ever notice. Yeah, that I don't know what it means that Paul doesn't kill that guy. He does kill that guy. It's also a weird thing that happens with our brains, which is like if in the first five minutes of a movie you show me and and play me the most amazing visuals and sound I've ever heard, well, I'm gonna get used to it. And then now like it doesn't matter if the next two hours are the most amazing visuals and sound I've ever heard because my brain is starting to adjust to it, you know, and not completely, it's still amazing, obviously, but there is a weird thing our brains do, even or if you have to like watch a movie in low quality on a bad screen, it sucks for five minutes and then you're like, but okay, now I'm watching a movie. I'm just kind of in it. So I think your point, Trisha, well, maybe not Michael. Michael's a freak of nature in the other. Were I not way. precisely me, which is now my favorite phrase. Yeah, right. that might be the case. Right. Um, but but I think to your point, Trisha, it's like you you can start to, to nitpick when right. you just sort of expect everything else to be perfect. And then right. you're like, okay, but what's not perfect? You know, and that's that's exactly. also how we are as humans. Like, how was your trip to Europe? It was amazing. Three weeks yep. of awesome stuff. But this one problem happened. And like, oh, that's that where your story is. Driver, and right. I don't want to hear yeah. about your wonderful, like, dinners. You know, <laughs> tell me about the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Make the hell out of your movies is a good lesson. Yes, uh, it is. Alex, what's your lesson? Mine is kind of along the same lines because, you know, I, if if Trisha's specific thing is I got to walk away with a theme, a clear theme in my head. When I go to a theater, especially, I want an experience, God damn it. And <laughs> this movie is an experience movie, you know, and it, and, and it took cynical mid 30s me and gave me like childhood uh, cinema, like ego disillusion. Like I was <laughs> lost, like, you know, it was it, it, which is like. It's like, I think people talk about, you know, uh, going to the theater, usually it's hyperbole and it kind of feels phony, like is like going to a temple, like it's a, it's like a religious experience. And there are a few movies that actually are able to create a sense of like awe and overwhelm and just overpowering you the way this film does. And I think it's really comes to Villeneuve's respect for creating uh through sound through visuals through the way he frames things 
a sense of like this is this is too big to even capture on the camera. The sandworm, we can never even get a good good look at its full yeah. mouth because it's just mm -hmm. too big to even look at. The sand as it's sinking as it goes by, it's just too much. It's and it's great. It and it and it and this movie commits to that weight with everything. Like even when the Bene Gesserit come and land, like their ship is scary. And like the mm -hmm. music and the sound of their ship is terrifying. And the Bene Gesserit themselves are kind of overwhelming in their presence they're big black you know uh hood things uh, <laughs> all of it is is just it's giving everything a weight that is the opposite of bouncy which is when, yep. I, <laughs> when i'm not when i'm not feeling overwhelmed by a movie it's because i'm looking at things that are bouncy and light and kind of mean nothing and there's no consequences and nobody's really ever in danger and there's no real tension this film often long stretches of it filled me with a sense of dread because there was something about the world that just felt so real and so overwhelming to my senses. And so God bless Denis Villeneuve. He, he did it. <laughs> he, he made, he, he said this movie, I understand why he was pissed about the HBO max thing because he yeah. made this movie as like a love letter to the theater experience. And mm. I think that that truly is what it is. Um, so if you don't want to make a bouncy movie, study this film because this <laughs> yep. this is like the anti-bounce epic yeah. alex's favorite toys as a kid were the ones that you threw at the ground and they stopped <laughs> <laughs> you just played with like weights yeah <laughs> dumbbells no it's like the one ring where you drop it and like, like magnetize yeah, it yeah. to the ground right. oh my god yeah. yeah no but but i i do think that uh there's something about the the power of film as a audio visual medium to like overwhelm yeah. uh which i think this movie is a great example of like it this overwhelms you in the best possible way which is i would say a type of like spiritual experience mm -hmm. so I, I that's that's where this movie is for me is that it gave me the the theater as temple experience and mm -hmm. that is a rare feat beautiful yeah. again go, just go to a theater to watch it yeah <laughs> to watch it go to watch it in theater yeah um <laughs> uh, okay well awesome uh what else have we been watching Trisha, what else have you been watching recently? Thank you so much for asking, Michael. Um, I am going to be as brief as I can. I caught a film of the Czech New Wave uh, from 1966. It's actually a quintessential film of the Czech New Wave, I'm coming to understand, um, which is something I'm still very much learning about. But it's a movie called Daisies uh, by Vera Chitilova. And it's an experimental movie. It's only an hour and 14 minutes long. It's about these two young women who decide that they're just going to be bad. And not sort of in the traditional sense um, of like, they're going to do a bunch of drugs and party really hard. Uh, they, they're just going to um, basically try to live sort of like a decadent and unfettered existence. And they start like, um, like kind of, ripping off old men where they're like have old men take them out to dinner because they flirt with them right and then they just like are gluttonous and they just like eat as much as they can and they just sort of um like trash restaurants <laughs> and like just run around and create chaos and um they have amazing 60s fashion and but uh, but that's none of that the plot is really not important because this is just a very experimental movie and most of it is just these little episodic scenes of um, bizarre, experimental, abstract filmmaking where the scenes are not connected to each other or even like within scenes where they'll be like sitting on, on um, like a street corner and then, you know, they're having the same conversation and they're standing in a field and then they're <laughs> like back on a street corner and then the whole um, frame is red. And, uh, then like there's huh. a, there's like, uh, the whole editing is, uh, the, the screen is chopped up into little pieces and then they're just like chopping up hot dogs with scissors. Um, <laughs> and it, like they're back in their apartment now. And, uh, like, are you, like, like, are you having a stroke? This sounds like <laughs> <a stroke. laughs> but, no, this movie, honestly, I really liked it. But, but when I say it, <laughs> I don't use the word experimental lightly. I, like right. I'm telling you, this is by a lot of people's standards would not be a movie. Right. Um, but it's, it is, uh, and is very fascinating. And so, like I said, if you are interested in getting into what was going on in Czech filmmaking in the sixties, a good entry point might be daisies. 
Got it. Noted. <laughs> great. He left us all speechless. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a it's got a great ending as well, and uh, yeah, sound is really interesting and funny, and the performances are great. Um, anyway, if you just like girls doing chaos which who doesn't um and you know the female filmmaker as well so mm. very cool interesting film thanks awesome i'm right, not gonna cool. say it's a story uh and certainly not gonna call it a movie it's neither <laughs> one of those <laughs> great sounds like it's good for precisely you <laughs> <laughs> indeed indeed alex what have you been watching so i caught the last duel which is also in theaters right now uh, directed by ridley scott and I remember seeing the trailer for this film and just being like, I think, Brian, you posted, you were like, you this is going to be an amazing movie or a really bad movie. And I can't tell. I, I don't know why you, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> right. Like you, you have Ben Affleck in kind of this awkward, like bowl cut wig or something. Mm. And, you know, Matt Damon. And but they're in this medieval times. Is that OK? Uh, but, man, I love this movie. It is a awesome. great Ridley Scott epic. And but with, you know. Uh, it's about perspective a lot and there's different perspectives and in a normal release Ridley Scott epic and the titular last duel is maybe the most stressed out I've been Ooh. watching two people fight because the stakes the movie sets up the stakes so well for this duel I was freaking out in the theater it was like not since children of men have i been that tense Ooh. watching a sequence okay and that is quite an accomplishment yeah. so just just to get to that scene and to feel those emotions, I highly recommend seeing The Lost Duel in theaters where you just are in that movie for that experience. I've heard awesome. nothing but good things. I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah. same. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. All right, cool. Brian, what have you been watching? Uh, well, as Spooktober is coming to an end, sadly, um, I just finished watching Midnight Mass on Netflix, Ooh. which is the new series uh, from Mike Flanagan, who directed Dr. Sleep and Hush and Haunting of Hill House and Bly Manor. Um, and his series have been interesting because they're always horror, but they're always very focused character dramas, too. Um, and Hill House was like, focus character drama and we're going to scare the hell out of you and Bly Manor and Midnight Mass are more like we're not necessarily we're going to scare you but we're not necessarily here to do that primarily like that'll happen when it happens but otherwise you are um just focusing these characters who have lots of long monologues about you know that sort of Sorkin thing of like of like hey why aren't you going to the party tonight you know when uh, when I was in the force uh, in the in my 20s, like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> but the, the actual plot is it's this small New England island uh, with a population of maybe 100 or so people. Classic small town story where everyone has history with each other. Everyone has a secret. Um, and then a new priest uh, played by Hamish Linklater, who does an awesome job. Uh, he comes to the church on the island and miracles start occurring. People seem to start being a little healthier and a little younger and et cetera but also people start disappearing and like strange things are happening and what's going on. And I'll leave it at that because part of the, that is part of the mystery that the show is setting up. Um, and the only, uh, by the end of the uh, seven part mini series, uh, limited series, I was happy that I watched it. I had a really good time with it. It took me almost half of the series to really kind of settle in. Um, mm -hmm. So I will say that as a sort of caveat, that's not the best thing when people are like, oh man, it's great after you watch the first eight seasons, then it really takes <laughs> out. <you know? laughs> right. um, but uh but I, but once it once it did settle in, I was like, you know what? I'm having a really good time with this. It's a lot of fun. And it's interesting and it's doing some cool stuff. So if you were thinking of checking it out, I would say check it out, just knowing that it might take you a couple episodes. And if you started and kind of checked out, I'd say go back and and commit to uh, to finishing it off because it's not the it's not like you know Mare of East Town quality or anything like that. But it is it is solid and it's just a lot of fun. Nice, awesome, yeah, cool, Michael. Uh, I so I finished Squid Game. Uh, I yeah. Alex has already mentioned it, uh, so I, I won't go into you know. Everyone knows about Squid Game. I don't need to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, but it was after hearing all about it, really fascinating to go on that journey, and I feel like it's a great example of just like really simple like premise can be taken. Can you can just do so much with mm -hmm. it? Yeah, like mm -hmm. lots of stakes, very simple premise, and then like surround it with characters to then get at theme things and you have a great package of a thing. So uh, yeah, very much enjoyed. As Alex said, not for the faint of heart, 
Mother, if you're listening, do not watch this one. Uh, <laughs> but it was great. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like the really cool thing the Korean cinema is doing, I talked about on um, uh, the Ring episode about horror being like a really good genre for theme because it's just like the thing is the thing. Um, and Squid Game isn't quite horror, but it's just like, what would you do for money? Basically, is right. like, you know, a very simple, the very simple question it asks. And then the entire plot of the show and every character's journey is all just based around the that one sentence you know so it's just yeah. just like parasite just like uh you know other bong joon ho movies uh they all are just like here is a really simple thing and we're going to go crazy with it but you're going to understand what this thematic core is behind all of it yeah nice absolutely yeah Awesome. Okay. Well, this has been our conversation about Dune. We want to say a big thank you, as always, to the patrons that make this show possible. If you want to join our community over on Patreon, we would love to have you. The link is in the show notes. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major. I'm Michael uh, Tucker. I had to read, I'm reading my name and I stumbled <laughs> over my name. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet and say hi. And as Brian said, for the next episode, we've teased it for long enough. We're going to finally find out what lies beneath. Yeah. So go Ooh. dig up a DVD of it somewhere if you can find it. Watch it. And we're going to talk about it in the next episode. We'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.